when we jump online and we kind of share our content and everything like that, we hold back. Maybe we've got a strong accent, we kind of dull it down or we have certain slang or strange words that we use and we put a mask and a filter on that. I've always been told most of my life that I'm weird, but I just think being weird is just being who you are. Hello, I'm Olivia D'Souza. I'm a multi-passionate entrepreneur. I'm a content and podcast expert. I support visionary entrepreneurs and leaders passionate about living with purpose. Join me as we explore podcasting, life, business and authenticity. Subscribe for meaningful conversations with a business buddy who gets what it's like. Welcome to Magnetic Pod. I'm stepping in the next little me. Welcome back to another episode of Magnetic Pod, where we delve into the world of business, personal growth, and living an impactful life. I'm your host, Olivia, or Livy, I can't decide which one, both are good. Uh, and today I am beyond excited to have the very special guest with us, Luke Page. Hooray! <laughs> <laughs> and the crowd goes wild. Yeah, wow. yeah. How many people we got in our studio, in our audience today? It's probably oh. about 500 or so. I think so, yeah, I can hear them. So Luke is a business coach, but not just any business coach. He's a master at helping coaches transform their businesses and guiding them to attract consistent clients and hit those 10K months consistently. With 14 years experience in teaching sales and leadership and the last six years specifically focusing on this niche of coaching coaches, Luke knows this area really, really well. But he's not all about business. He's also about having fun, living healthy, following your heart and embracing your own unique weirdness. And today he's here to help share his wealth of knowledge on how to position yourself as a leader in your industry and sell in a way that feels natural, not pushy at all, and to use social media to attract and convert your ideal clients. How does that sum it up? Yeah, I tell you what. You just know me too well. How do you how do you know all that? <laughs> Thanks for the intro. Yes. Olivia. Yeah, welcome. Thank now, one you. of the things that stood out, and I have been on your podcast, so I think I, I asked there, but I want to ask mm. you on my own podcast about the weirdness. I love that you say that sort of comes through in a few of the things that you say. So mm. what is it about weirdness? What makes you weird and why do you mm. want to celebrate weirdness? What does it mean to you? Uh, okay, do, I, do you want me to go down... What does weirdness mean to me? What makes me weird? Like everything? Whatever. Take it away. Whatever. I think everyone's weird in their own way mm-hmm. if if you really get to know everyone, mm-hmm. if that makes sense. Yep. I think what happens a lot of the time is in order for us to be liked by everyone, which is just a common thing that everyone wants, yeah, or most mm-hmm. people unless you're probably insane, but we just have this massive fear of caring what people think of us especially when it comes to if we're talking social media and showing up online, it's a really scary thing because, hey, if you're going to post your stuff, you're going to let the world in to be judged and it's a really scary thing. So generally what happens is when we jump online and we kind of share our content and everything like that, we hold back. Maybe we've got a strong accent, we kind of dull it down or we have certain slang or strange words that we use and we put a mask and a filter on that. We do have particular traits about us that we kind of filter a little bit. We've got strong opinions and beliefs and we don't share those. So, yeah, I just think that the weirdness thing, I've always been told most of my life that I'm weird, but I don't know. I just think being weird is just being who you are. Yeah, and in a really, 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 really heavily, could say in regards to platform and social media where it's very, very hard to get attention and stand out. If you're not being weird, then you're just going to blend in with the majority of people. So it's a really massive thing. So yes, and I'm forever just trying to get more and more weird. That's <laughs> ultimately it. Without it sounds like it's about flipping the story that we give our traits because we can initially be, you know, wanting to protect ourselves and keep ourselves safe by being the same and blending in and not admitting to things that are a bit different or quirky or, or whatever, mm. but they end up being your superpower if you can be authentic. Yeah, for sure. I mean, if you look at like the best content creators in the world, the most popular people, a lot of them that you think of and you look up to, they've just got this something about them that makes them unique. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So it is, it's a superpower. You know, if you think the public speaking is a really good example because everyone can chat one-on-one like we are now, but then if you throw us in front of thousands of people, 
the confidence goes, the ability to think on the fly, to be able to be dynamic when we speak, to be able to recall stories or whatever it is or knowledge. When we get thrown in front of the, the crowd, we are like, shit, everyone's watching me and I'm scared of stuffing up and I'm worried what people think. So we go into this massive shell and we lose our power of who we truly are. So I think that's just kind of explains what it's like. It's a good analogy. You know, if you can get up in front of the thousands of people and just be yourself, you're going to smash the stage and just kill it, right? But if you get up there and you're so freaked out about what people are going to think and same thing if we're going to be posting stuff online or whatever it is, man, you're just going to suck, yeah? So that's it. Actually, the accent thing, is it, wasn't mm. that a, a bit of a journey you went on? Mm. I think I saw yep. or listened to one of your podcasts. Yes, the accent thing, absolutely. And, uh, I mean, I've been on, like I've had my business for about five years and if I think about from when I first started it and even before I had my business, I was doing stuff online and I had another business. So I've kind of been posting videos and doing content for, I don't know, maybe seven years and I actually did YouTube content when YouTube like almost first came out I posted stuff on YouTube right so take away that era because I purely did that for my mates and no one else but talking about you know I've been posting stuff for seven years and if I look back when I first started oh OMG how restricted I was in regards to number one perfection every video had to be perfect and you know re-recorded a million times if I got one little word wrong or I paused anything like, or I didn't like the look of my face, re-record and re-record and re-record and re-record and re-record and I would like script things. Oh, and it's like thinking back through it, it's really painful. It really is. And whenever I watch a video, and I watched a video of myself last week, it's painful to watch it. It really hurts because it, it takes me back to how how hard it all was and how much I freaked out and how when I finally did post something, I'd be freaking out what people are going to think. And I was like in this battle of, Mm. okay, Luke, be courageous and post this, yeah, which I generally was that type of person, Livia, where I had courage to do things that scared me. But it was like even though I had the courage to do it, I was still freaking out that I was doing it. And it wasn't like post a video and then walk away and forget about it, which I do now. It's like post a video and then you freak out about it. You're sitting there on the couch going, oh, shit, and wondering, picturing people watch it, picturing what they're going to say, picturing them speaking to their mates and sharing it with them and saying, oh, look what Luke's doing, look at – and all these mm-hmm. thoughts. It was like torture. It really was. And then talking about the accent thing, you know, when I started this coaching business, I started dealing with clients overseas from America and I was really worried that if they find out I'm Australian, this is funny as, so I was worried that if they find out I'm Australian, they're going to leave me, yeah? <laughs> so did you just not speak? <laughs> so I just kind of, you know, took away the roughness and rawness of my Australian accent. And I was just very careful and selective of the words. Like, for example, what do I say now? Oh, yeah. Like, so I, I I'll jump on a video and I did a live before and I'm like, what's cracking my jacking? Like this, what the hell does that mean? Obviously, it means what's up, right? (laughs) But if you're not from Australia, what's cracking my jacking would be like, I guess you kind of get it because it's like the start, but it doesn't really make sense. And like stuff Mm -hmm. like that, there's no way known I would have said that. No way known. But now it's just I have the freedom to do it and uh, it's not like I'm immune to caring what other people think. I still do care what other people think. But it's not unhealthy anymore, Olivia, yeah? Mm -hmm. It's not unhealthy like it used to be. And we can torture ourselves with these stories, but, you know, you've got to hand it to that previous version of yourself who got you Mm. where you are today. But really, I mean, the the Americans would probably think you're a dead set legend because all the the, the very cool, all the really Uh, cool Australians, they'd probably just imagine that you can wrestle crocodiles as well. And That's exactly what they think, yeah. (laughs) (laughs) Definitely. Yeah. It wasn't until I got feedback from a group of Americans saying they love my accent where I started to embrace it. Yeah. Because I was Mm -hmm. thinking the opposite. And then I realized, hey, there are people out there that actually like it and, you know, like my accent and that's me. So I kind of started going down that realization, that journey of realization that the secret is, you know, learning to love yourself and realizing that you're not going to be loved by everyone, but your true fans will love you for who you are. So that was kind of going through that journey, which took a number of years. But yes, be very rewarding. I think we're always going through that. We're just peeling back another layer 
to be more authentic and more brave. And you sound yeah. to me like you're always on that journey of, yeah, taking yourself to the next level and challenging yourself and doing something that's a bit scary. Now, mm. the other thing that what you were talking about reminded me of is the public speaking. And can you tell me about the public speaking and trams challenge that you set for yourself? What was yeah. that about? When I, before I started this company, I was working for a, another coaching company which did basically a very similar thing. We taught coaches how to grow their online business to seven figures. So that's how I, where I kind of learned about the coaching industry. And the owner of that company, really young guy, he was, I think he was 25 at the time. I was maybe 30 when I was working there. And he used to do these, like he had like 100,000 followers on Facebook, like kind of a big deal back those days. These days, it's probably like nothing. 100,000 followers on Facebook and he had a, he used to do all these like kind of fear challenge videos. That's how he got popular and how he got well-known around the world. And one of them was doing a speech on a tram. So, he used to set his staff fear challenges. So, one of the fear challenges was that we had to go do tram speeches. So, you know, in the middle of work, we'd just go, group of us would go jump on trams and do speeches and... You know, I was so scared of public speaking and I, I just did it over and 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 over. And it got to the point where I literally could jump on a tram and this is by myself, yeah. I even would do it without people. Jump on a tram and literally had no care, get up there and just start blabbering on and people look at you <laughs> like a weirdo. People don't listen to you. Some people what might What did you clap. talk about? I generally spoke about what I was doing, just saying, hey, hey, everyone, just want to do a, a, a quick little message talking about facing your fears. Yeah, I'm doing something right now. I'm, I'm, sh I'm scared sitless. Have a look at my fingers. They're shaking. Yeah. But, uh, you know, I don't want to let this fear stop me from being the person I want to be and achieving what I want. And I'm not going to let fear stop me. And I want, hopefully, this message can inspire you to do the same. What reaction? Did anything come from that? I, I, that would have led to some interesting conversations, I'd imagine. Yeah. Well, you'd get. Some people would like, you know, give it the clap and the nod and stuff. Most people would have the earphones in, yeah. <laughs> I, it's I'm, I must, harder and harder like that. Yeah, I must say though, back when I did do it in the era, like these days, the video that you watched, I did that purely to record the video, right? And that was last year, I think it was. But back when I did the tram speeches originally, which would have been, I don't know, 2017 or something like that, people weren't at the level of fixation on their phones. They still were, but not to the level where it's at right now. Not as many AirPods and headphones. Mm -hmm. So you had more of a reaction. There were still people wearing headphones and all that, but you had more of a reaction. And you also had more ears open, even if they, that a lot of them would pretend that they're not listening, but they're clearly listening, right? So it was a lot of heads down on phones but not earphones in. As in these days, if you jump on a tram, probably 50, 60% of people have got headphones in. So you're going to lose those people unless they take them out. So yeah, the reactions were, yeah, you get some people to clap. Some people like if you smile and nod the head, some people, you know, you'd really go, they're getting this message and that you can see them thinking. And yeah, some people you could just see they're looking at the window and you know they're listening to you and you know they're thinking, you can see the thought in their mind that they're thinking, but they're pretending not to listen to you. So the great thing about that is I have no idea of what happened with that. I have no idea what message that fell on what is and what action was taken from that. But the truth is, is that out of those, I don't know, let's just say I've done 50 of them, it has there been one person's life where they've made a drastic action off it? I have no doubt in my mind. And how many people would use their example of me being on the tram because it's something that you remember, yeah? You can always think of certain things. Oh, I saw that person do this and I was walking through the airport and I saw a daughter run up to her, I don't know, her dad and give her the biggest hug and that stuck with me for the rest of my life. It's things like that, I think they stay with people. So mm. I have no doubt for some people they would always remember that. And that's pretty special to think about, yeah? Who knows what effect it's had on people? I'll never know, but I'm sure it has. I just find it fascinating and a bit baffling about us earthlings. <laughs> no, the fact that, that that takes us such bravery, that mm. just stepping out of we don't realise how restricted we are 
until you think about doing something like that and the fact that that freaks you out. I mean, why does that freak anybody out? Until the age of about five or so is my theory, just looking at our toddlers growing up before they head to school, like they are free little and I really envy that and that they are my role models to some, you know, to some extent. We need to learn things because we need to unlearn so much that I just feel like... Aliens would come to it and observe us and go, why are they so, <laughs> what are all these strange ideas they have and why did that take so much bravery and why is that so much out of the normal to stand up and communicate with mm. your fellow earthlings, so to speak? It's yeah. we're just a funny lot. We are. We're weirdos. We're just a, a pack of, a pack <laughs> so of weirdos. What is, yeah, just being authentic is, is brave in, in this world we live in. It is. It is. All right. Well, so much I'd love to chat about, but how about we get to the business end, I guess, as far as content creation and how to do that in a way that attracts your ideal client. Sounds good. So basically, because I know that's what we're going to chat about today, is how do we create content that gets awesome engagement, but ultimately I talk about creating content that gets people DMing you, asking you to work with you. So I call it Netflixy content, which I love this name. Now, why did I call it Netflix? I'm just like, well, everyone's got Netflix for starters, yeah? Netflix mm-hmm. is the most popular paid streaming platform in the world. There's, at the moment of recording this, is about 240 million subscribers, thereabouts. Mm-hmm. And I'm like, well, obviously they're doing something right. So I kind of had a look at it and I'm like, well, what does Netflix do? And I'm like, what are these? What are the things they focus on? I found that there was three pillars And if we're talking about creating content, we'll just call them three content pillars, right? Which number one is variety. And I've got like a bunch of things I'm going to be reading off here. So number one is variety. Number two is originality. And then number three is consistency, right? So we basically want to look at what do Netflix do and how can we kind of copy it, right? So let's start off with the first pillar, which is variety. So what a lot of – now, my audience is coaches. Yeah, Olivia. So Mm -hmm. are there coaches that listen to this? Yeah, yes. They have quite a few of my – quite a lot of people in my orbit are coaches, yes. Okay, so coaches, online entrepreneurs. Look, majority of this will apply to you. Some of it possibly won't if you're not a coach because I've kind of done this off based off coaches, yeah. So a lot of – if you're creating – and I'm just going to say coach, okay? So if you're not a coach, mm-hmm. that's cool. So a lot of coaches, they when they create content, they post the same sort of content, yeah? Because we just get into – we find that there's a particular style and type of content that we are most comfortable with and we tend to post it over and over and over and over and over. But it's like if you look at good old Netflix – have you got Netflix, by the way? Yes, I do. Okay. Mostly my kids – Take over, Mostly but kids. yes, I do have it. <laughs> okay, so Netflix, you jump on there and they got everything. Yeah, it doesn't matter what mood you're in, they got something for you. If you want to watch a drama, family drama, or you want to be you know, on the edge of your seat and get some anxiety running through your bones, you can watch a thriller or a horror movie. They got documentaries, they got comedies, they got everything for every person at any time. So we want to copy the same thing. Yeah, if Netflix just had comedies, for example, they would have way less. They won't have 240 million subscribers, right? Because it's the same thing. If everything you jumped on Netflix is like, oh, another comedy. I'm like, oh, another comedy. I'm like, I loved a comedy yesterday, but you know what? I want to watch a doco today. I want to get a little bit serious. I want to learn something, yeah? So if we take the same sort of success that Netflix has had with that and relate it to our own content, there's eight different types of of content. I'm going to read them through. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So the first type of content is how to content. And this is the most popular type of content that coaches and people will post. And it's basically content where it's like teaching some sort of skill and giving like tips and advice. Yeah. Helping Mm -hmm. people get a certain result. Very straight. It's like kind of how to grow a podcast, how to increase engagement. Like this podcast, what we're doing right now is ultimately Mm -hmm. a how to episode how to create content that gets people DMing you. It's how to. It's what most mm-hmm. people would do, right? How to go from point A yeah. to point B. Simple, simple. Now, we want to do more than that. Now, that's great mm-hmm. to do those things because it creates trust that you're an expert and that you're good at what you do. 
But we want to do additional things to that. So the second one is relatable content. Mm-hmm. So relatable content is where you demonstrate like a specific thought or action that your target market has. Yeah. So mm-hmm. one that I have done in the past is you might relate to this later. Yeah? That um you're in the say, have you ever been in bed, right? You're trying to sleep and then you got, you know, your mind's racing with ideas. And then yeah. like, you know, you write you reach across to your phone, you go into the notes and you type in the idea so you don't lose it. Mm-hmm. I don't know. Have you ever done that before? So usually I sleep, wake up, and then that happens. I wake up okay. and have the idea. Yeah. You've, you've got it there. I personally do it quite often. So I'm like, oh, I'm like, if, if this is happening to me, I dare say it's happening to a lot of my audience, right? Mm. So I, what I do, I just create a video reenacting what's going on. So it shows me I'm in mm. bed trying to sleep, and then I get this idea, pops in my mind, I quickly reach across my phone, throw the old the note in there quickly go back to bed and then bang, another idea pops in my mind and then I reach over the phone again and it's just a relatable content. Now, when your audience, Mm -hmm. uh, if they also go through the same thing, they're like, oh, yes, that's me. Yeah, I do the same thing Mm -hmm. and it connects you to people. They start relating to you. So that's the second one. Third one. The third one is belief-busting content. So belief-busting content is what makes you stand out out and it's almost like where you take the common beliefs in an area that you help out with Mm -hmm. and you basically go the opposite to what they say right yeah so it's kind of like you're busting through like biggest misconceptions in your market Mm -hmm. example of one that i did recently is imposter syndrome basically i constantly see coaches talking about how bad imposter syndrome is Imposter syndrome, and it's just a common thing. We don't want imposter syndrome. It doesn't feel good. And there's like Mm. people talking about imposter syndrome. Don't do it. It's bad stuff, everything like that. So I'm like, all right, I take what the majority are saying, which is imposter syndrome is bad, and I just do the opposite. So if Mm. if everyone's saying it's bad, what do I say? It's good or there's a positive aspect to it. That's it. So I create a video and I say imposter syndrome is the best thing that can ever happen to you. So – it's a belief-busting little hook that grabs people's attention because you're going against what everyone else says and then you give it reasons why, right? Mm-hmm. You've obviously got to give reasons why you're saying that statement, yeah? But as soon as you do that, as soon as you drop something that's against what everyone else says, you instantly stand out like that. So it's hmm. really effective content. Yeah. Is this all making sense? Yes, it does because it grabs your attention because it gives. it's like, huh. That's a new way of looking at a thing that you hadn't thought of, you know, looking at that way. So, yeah. Yeah, exactly. All right, number four, vulnerable content. Pretty straightforward. We've heard a million times, got to be vulnerable. Mm. You know, us as coaches, we know a lot. We've done a lot of training and things like that. But if we are constantly just sharing how good we are and how certain we are and how we know everything and, you know, we're never scared or afraid or we never struggle or fail or anything like that, then it's going to create a bit of a disconnect between people. They might learn a lot of stuff from you, but they might be like, oh, that Luke guy, he's a little bit, I don't know, almost like, oh, I, I can't feel I can connect into him because, you know, I'm struggling so bad and he's just living a, he's just a, living a perfect life. So that's the kind of feeling that happens, yeah? Um, yeah, like it's unattainable. It's unattainable, yeah. So vulnerable mm. content, it just builds relatability. With your audience. Mm. Number five. And how do you think we're going doing this over a podcast, by the way, with a bit of the information here? Is people good? Are yeah. they following, you reckon? Maybe you should write this down. Stop. <laughs> Stop driving. Stop driving. <laughs> write all this stuff down. I'm going to give you a pop, pop quiz at the end. Pop quiz. That's it. That's it. We're not leaving this till we get the, get the, the exam out. You've got to pass. Otherwise, you, <laughs> otherwise you, can't, you can't listen to one more of Olivia's podcasts. <laughs> Sorry. It's the rules. <laughs> all right. So uh-huh. no, number five, inspirational content. And this is where you, you, know, you do the inspirational quotes or you might do some sort of little video, whatever it is. Just The idea of this is you want to inspire your audience to take action on things that are hard for them or just take action towards their dream. So we spoke about the tram rants, yeah, Um, doing the Mm -hmm. speeches. That's inspirational content. 
Yeah. Because people watch that and they go, oh, man, this dude's doing that crazy thing. Then, man, I can jump on and do a video. Yeah. Yeah. So inspirational content is really awesome because if you do it well, and mind you, like I said, it can be just a quote, yeah? can be just a quote. It can be a quote, but it also can be you walking the walk and being the role model. That's even. Yeah. So it can be both. It's all important, but yeah. All important. Just anything where like, you know, if you can get your audience, you want to be getting them inspired to take action because if you Mm. can do something or say something and they go off and take action off the back of it, they're going to remember you, yeah? It's a really effective way of communicating with your audience and getting them kind of getting to the front of their mind. All right, number six is personal content. Pretty straightforward. It's just kind of sharing more of your personal life. Look, some people will say that you don't do personal life, others will. I'm on the side of doing personal life. Obviously, you've got to point, draw the line somewhere, right? My, the way I see it is that you know, if I look at anyone that I look up to, I want to know what they do outside their business. You know what I mean? So I think that, and so does your, your fans want to know as much about you as possible. So it's like if you can share a little bit of your personal life, you know, what are you into outside of your business and your work and things like that, it's just, you know, they're going to possibly connect with you a little bit more. All right, number seven, <laughs> number seven of eight. So selling content. Yes, this is where you actually sell your stuff. Now, some people are like just nonstop with selling. They sell too much. But then a lot of people avoid it and you need to sell more. So you're allowed to actually create posts where you're purely advertising something. So it, you can either be selling your actual program or your product or you can just be saying, hey, I've got my podcast. Go listen to my podcast. Or I've got, hey, I've got this free lead magnet or whatever you want to call it, freebie. Here, yeah, download it. So but you want to be adding in selling content and whether it's to get you sales or whether it's to get you leads, that's what selling content is. Do you do that in, would you do that in, a, that's in the mix? It's not necessarily every post, it's... No, nah, not at all. It's, yeah. yeah, I mean, all of these, eight of them, like you don't want to be doing them all the time. You just want to be kind of rotating between them, yeah. Yeah. You know, the old Gary V thing is the jab, 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 right hook thing. So, you know, you've, yes. you're kind of giving out three bits of content and then you do like a, a bit of an ask on the fourth one. And that's pretty healthy doing something like that, yeah. If you're doing uh, a three-to-one ratio... Yeah, it's fairly pretty healthy. I would say, you know, four to one ratio, but Mm -hmm. that's basically it. So you might, for example, I'll just finish on this last one, which is called News Reporter. You know the green screen ones? Oh, yes. Where you have like, you know, you put like the article. These ones are so easy to make and they're effective. So the News Reporter is where generally what you do is you grab like an article related to your industry or your market Mm -hmm. or niche and then you just do the green screen where you're commenting on over the top of it super easy to make and a lot of the time you don't even have to share your opinion i think that the secret with these ones is you don't actually share your opinion you almost like comment on it saying this is what's happening you got this these group of people or this happening here and then you got these people saying this hey what's your thoughts and you almost like leave it up to an open debate and discussion and then you'll get people on both sides kind of chiming in with their opinion so it's a really effective way of doing it. You can jump in and go, hey, this is my opinion. You know, they're saying this, da 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 But also another way of doing it is where you don't take a side and you just comment on what they're saying and then you say, hey, what's your thoughts on it? Yeah. Mm-hmm. <laughs> so what I was going to say is that with all these, Livia, is you want to just, you know, rotate between everything. Yeah. So once you roll these down, you can be like, okay, what have I posted last? And you might be like, oh, I did a how-to and I did a vulnerable and I did a, a selling one. You're like, okay, cool. What haven't I done the list? You're like, oh, I haven't done a belief buster. So I'm like, oh, my next one will be my belief buster or I haven't done a news reporter. So when you have this list in front of you, you just have a look at what you posted and it's very easy to go, okay, my next one's got to be a belief buster. Sweet. Okay, what is generally what are a lot of people saying what are some misconceptions or what are a lot of people saying in my market oh they're saying that you know imposter syndrome everyone hates it everyone's bad i'm like cool i'm going to say the opposite now how do i build a case that the opposite is good so it makes it very easy to create content because you've got an idea in your mind and then you've just got to kind of build it from there if that makes sense I guess once you have the framework too that you would go around with that filter on so you're probably scrolling on social media or listening to podcasts or, or whatever and then you mm. can 
do you have a little file that kept away of, oh, I could do, that could be a belief buster one. That could be a... Yes, yes, absolutely. That's a good pickup, yeah? That's mm-hmm. what you want to do. As you get ideas, you write them into your little file and you put a, a thing next to them, you label them. So, yeah, belief button, that's exactly what I do, Olivia. So you put your label news reporter or belief buster or vulnerable. And then, yeah, if you get your ideas there, you're like, sweet, what's next on your list? And like, oh, I'm up to a vulnerable post. And hey, there's my idea they've already got. I'm just going to bang, grab that and do that. Create it. Nice. Fantastic. So is there anything that I didn't ask you that you want to make sure you let my listeners know before we? Well, the last thing is Mm -hmm. just to kind of finish on those pillars, which I won't go as long. The three Mm -hmm. content pillars that Netflix follow. Number one Ah, is variety. Number two is originality. And number three is consistency. Coincidentally, we spoke about originality at the start of this podcast, Mm. Olivia. You know, if you look at Netflix, they have their exclusive Netflix movies that no other platform can have, yeah? Mm. So once you've done your variety, you then need to be original with your content, which is just what we spoke about at the start, which is just showing up as the real you. And, you know, it's baby steps, right? So Mm. just the next thing that you create today or whatever it is, this just show a tiny bit more of your personality. Just do 10%, yeah, or just do at least 5%. Or, you know, share something that's like maybe you've got super, super controversial opinions. Just maybe share like an opinion that's not crazily controversial but a little bit, a little bit. You want to like baby steps there. And then mm-hmm. the last pillar is consistency. Netflix are always providing new content. So you want to do the same thing. And the way that... I talk about doing this is number one, having a minimum posting agreement. A minimum posting agreement is agreement that you make with yourself that you will post this minimum amount of content every week, rain, hail or shine, whether you're feeling amazing, Mm -hmm. whether you're feeling terrible and it's a number that you meet no matter what. So whatever platform you got, you work it out. So say for example, you use Instagram, you're like, okay, how many posts? And you're like, okay, I'm going to do three posts, for example, I'm going to do five posts or 10 posts and how do you get the number? Basically, you look at what's a number that is not crazily unachievable or it's like, you know, way too hard to sustain but then what's a number that's going to slightly push yourself each week, yeah? So, for example, if you're like five will be like, man, I could do it one week but I don't know if I could keep that up. One's like, oh, easy. I'm just kind of like, I'm just relaxing and kind of being lazy. You might be like, okay, I'm going to do three. That's going to be my minimum posting amount. And some weeks you'll post more than the three, which is fine. But every week, whether you're sick, whether you're killing it, you do minimum three, yeah? And you make that agreement Mm -hmm. and then you plan for that. So at the every end of every week, my last day of the week is Friday. So I have a little appointment in my diary called content planning. And then what you do is you plan out your content for the next week. Now, if your minimum posting agreement, if you've agreed to doing three posts, then all you've got to do is go, cool, what are the topics for those three posts? Topic number one, belief buster. I'm going to talk about this. Post number two, vulnerable posts. I'm going to talk about this. You don't create the content, you just get the topic there. That way, when you start your week the next week, You've got everything planned out and you've just got to create the content and then you don't sit there and procrastinate over, what am I doing? (laughs) What am I doing, man? You get straight into it because you've already got the topic and then you just create it. And then because you haven't procrastinated, you haven't lost the time and you get it done. On the other side, what happens if you don't do this and you walk into your week and like, what am I doing this week? You sit there and you go, oh, what am I doing? And you like procrastinate, procrastinate. Before you know it, hours have gone by. Then you start freaking out. You're like, I'm losing time. You start getting overwhelmed because you're overwhelmed. You don't do any work. Before you know it, then you're like, you're feeling <laughs> crap. And you're like, I feel attacked. Damn, I need to go to that. Like, don't, well, I'm attacking myself. I obviously know these feelings. <laughs> So then you go and you're like, I'm watching Netflix. Yeah, I'm watching Netflix. (laughs) So, yeah, planning is, it just really helps prevent that. And it won't help it prevent it 100%. And, you know, I had an episode on, I think it was Thursday last week in the morning where I did exactly that, Olivia, yeah, where I went Mm -hmm. into the day unprepared, went into, what was it for? This was something, doesn't matter. But then I was like trying to think. Then I'm like, I can't think of it. I started getting stressed and I'm like, oh, I'm running out of time. And then that, I go into the pattern. You start freaking out and then I'm like, okay, I need to relax. And I'm like, I don't want to work. 
And then I was out and I lost until about 11.30 in the morning. So I lost half my day and mm-hmm. I made a recovery. But that's what it does. It's what it does. So that is it. That is my last words, by the that way, Olivia. That is great. That's my last okay. words. Okay. I could talk with you for ages because you've got so much gold, but I, instead I will send people to the Luke Page podcast. Send it to the Luke Page podcast if you like. Yeah, yes. Yeah, go check it out. Go, go check, check it out. Go check so it many- out. Levy is on there. So, I mean, I love your idea, for example, that you were saying about the, and I, I heard that in one of your podcast episodes too, where you set yourself, you make a promise to yourself. I think it was about your podcast that yeah. you were saying it, that I heard, that you have to get one out a week and yeah. like, so you did one in your car yes. to get it done. It's a minimum so, posting yeah. agreement. It's a minimum posting yes. agreement. So I have one for a podcast, yeah? That's the deal. So if you stick to your word, yeah, then if you keep your word mm. and if you, what you say is important to yourself, then it, it pushes you to do it. That's it. Mm. But it also, you know, it's that positive feedback loop that if you keep that word to yourself, it's going to just, you know, be good for your belief in yourself and oh, your yeah. Massive. success. Massive, yeah. And how can people find you? How can people work with you? Just go check me out on Instagram. So at Luke underscore page. Go say hello. How you going? How you going, mate? Go give him a follow. Yeah. Follow, mate. Give me a follow, give a follow mate. Follow. Give me a bloody follow, <laughs> will ya? Go follow, go subscribe, do all yeah. the things, and I'll put all the links in the show notes. Beautiful. All right. All Thank right. you so much. Thanks, Livia. I'm stepping in the next level me. I'm here to be everything I can be. Like a snake, I'm shedding my skin to be. Hello, it's Livy here. Have you ever wondered about what the key elements are that make a podcast truly stand out? Or maybe you're thinking about starting your own special podcast and feel a bit overwhelmed and don't know where to start. Well, I have something for you. Introducing the ultimate podcast checklist. It's a step-by-step guide that covers everything from the initial brainstorming to advanced growth strategies. It's the perfect companion for both new and seasoned podcasters. And the best part, it's absolutely free. (laughs) To grab your copy, simply head to the show notes of this episode and you will find a direct link there and then away you go. Remember, every podcast started with that initial spark and the right resource. So let the ultimate podcasting checklist be yours.